So to begin with, I'm really feeling privileged to have Dr. Varanji with us today. Um, I have known him personally for the past five years. Uh, he is the director of Mansa Psychiatry Hospital and Dr. Sharma's Rehabilitation Center at Hakimpet. Most of us might have seen uh, Dr. Varanji Sharma on our TVs. He has several achievements uh, to his credit. Uh, he's been really nice, good to make a very short profile. I know uh, it, the session would be uh, not enough to complete what he has achieved. So to begin with, uh, the first thing is he is a recipient of Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Memorial Excellence Award 2020. He has published a paper in the International Journal of Scientific Research also a paper in Indian Journal of Psychological Medicine and several other papers in national and state level conferences. He has been one of the state toppers in the field of psychiatry 2015. He has been invited as a guest speaker by the Academy of Family Physicians of India, Telangana chapter. He has been a corporate uh, speaker, I think so for a very long time now and has been delivering several workshops, webinars on stress management sessions, and other psychiatric uh, issues for various prestigious companies like TCS, Uber, OYO, ZenQ, Medversity, and the list will go on. He has also been invited as a guest speaker on the national podium, uh, annual national conference of the Indian Psychiatric Society to speak on suicides, uh, January, 2020. He has participated in more than 1000 television uh, debates, including national media, I think the latest uh, one was the suicide case of the couple from the educational institute who were not able to clear the debts as they couldn't, I mean, as they could not clear the school fees. Uh, he has also uh, debated on several social issues and chaired panel with reputed police officers, advocates, celebrities, doctors, and it will go on. But here I present Dr. Varanji Sharma. A very good morning, sir. Very good morning, Am. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for the very kind introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Vishwa and uh, Roshni Paras for having me today. Uh, I feel it as a privilege uh, to be here talking to all of you today. And uh, without wasting much time, I think we'll go on with the program and I would love to interact with uh, everyone by the end of the show. So uh, I would love to have uh, many as many questions as we can. So, thank you. When we talk about mental health, or we talk about health, uh, usually uh, we think that as long as we are not having any illness, we are healthy. Uh, but if you go back to the World Health Organization definition of health, WHO says that health is a state of physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely an absence of an illness. So just because we don't have an illness, we can't say that we are healthy. So there should be a well-being there should be a mental well-being. There should be an ability to cope up with the normal stressors. Uh, there should be an ability to be productive and contribute something to the country. And that exactly is mental health. So now when we are talking about when we should be visiting a mental health professional, I would like to explain this probably uh, you know, uh, in a very different manner today. So let's try to talk about a physical illness like diabetes. I'm talking about diabetes because we all know what diabetes is. We've heard, you know, somebody who has diabetes and we know that diabetes has a lot of complications. So now let's look it back, used, what used to happen in the 1980s. So somebody who had diabetes never knew what diabetes is. And then uh, suddenly would develop a whole lot of symptoms. He still wouldn't know what was happening with him. And then finally, he would develop an ulcer like this, an ulceration like this, which I'm showing in the first picture. I'm sorry to start your day with a picture like this, but uh, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, back in 1980s, I think this is how a person with diabetes would present. Then time started changing and, you know, people started realizing that there is an illness called diabetes and, you know, there are some warning symptoms. And that is when, you know, in the early 2000s, probably, people started, you know, coming to doctors with symptoms. I'm feeling a lot more thirsty. Uh, I'm, I'm urinating a lot more than before. I'm, I'm eating a lot more than before. Or I'm having some tingling sensations in my palms. I'm having some tingling sensations in my feet. 
and that is when the doctor would say oh this could be diabetes you're you're in the early setting of diabetes uh, let's immediately start working on it so this was 2000 and when we talk about today people go get their blood sugars done when they know they are in a risk of getting diabetes the risk could be coming from genetically the risk could be coming from the lifestyle factors you have so in the changing times people also have been changing now let's compare the same thing with mental health now back in the 1980s a psychiatrist would be called upon or a clinical psychologist would have been called upon to talk to a patient after the patient attempted a suicide so somebody attempted a suicide we saved them the person is in the icu and that is when they would say you know uh, why don't you come down i think this person needs mental health help and then you know coming into the early 2000s you know people started understanding that yes uh, i'm having some symptoms and i don't want to land up like that person uh, you know in a suicide so let me go to a mental health professional but now talking about today with the changing lifestyles with the kind of stress every individual is facing i would say it is time to prevent mental health issues and that is where i say every individual needs regular mental health help even though you do not have an illness how do we know that we have an illness we would know that only when we would go to a mental health professional and talk to them and understand what exactly uh, the things happening with us uh is it normal or is it abnormal are we really able to cope up uh, are we not able to uh, cope up with these situations so i think all these questions that we have in our head can be dealt by a mental health professional so i think like you know the title says uh, seeking mental health help does not mean that you are weak it just means that you are smart you don't want something like uh, you know a suicidal attempt or you know a severe symptoms which will uh stop you from going into your day to day activities so you want to regularly screen just like how everybody has an annual health check up you get your ecg done you get your blood sugars done you check your cholesterol similarly i would say every individual needs regular mental health screening to understand the normalcy and the abnormality so i was trying to show about diabetes you know where people would start off with ulcerations now talking about mental health if you ask me today like i said screening is the key to prevent mental health issues right sir perfect and uh, having said this again the most common um, complaint which the clients or the patients come up is um mom i think too much or am i overthinking or am i having negative thoughts i am not able to sleep and it's my mind is continuously thinking and they are advises at home no you have to think positively don't overthink but sadly they don't know how to do it so can you please elaborate is this the situation where they have to come down to a mental health professional well let's try to again take you know a physical health example so that we understand this a little more better uh you know nowadays you know all of us wear these smart watches which you know shows your heart rate or uh, there are watches which show the ecg also these days yes. so uh you know suppose if my resting heart rate currently is 72 is it really possible for me to increase my heart rate to 85 all of a sudden can i can i like just tell my heart why don't you start beating at 84 or is it really possible for me to tell my heart why don't you go down to 62 it's not really possible because this particular activity of the heart is not in our voluntary control it is your brain controlling the heart rate as similar as the brain controlling the heart rate it is your brain that controls your thoughts now let's try to understand a little i'm sure you know we all know this picture you know this is uh, the security check happening in the airport at some point you know uh, uh, you know we must have seen you know people crowding outside the airports uh, you know to either receive or send off uh, people and then you know it's only few people who go into the airport and uh, go inside the airport and once you go inside the airport it's again very few people 
who cross through the security check and then are able to board the flight. Now let's try to take this example into the brain. Now there is a lot of information in the brain which is in your subconscious memory. You know, that's like the storeroom in your house. You know, you dump everything in the storeroom. So everything, you, you go to the grocery store, you bring a lot of things, you put them in the storeroom. Now that's your subconscious memory. Now, this information from the subconscious memory or in the storeroom wants to come into your because it knows there's a lot of activity happening in the living room. Living room is more happening than the storeroom. So now this information slowly starts walking towards the living room. And this is exactly where a few brain centers act like these security checks. Now the brain center says, stop, 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 who are you? Why are you coming today? Then this particular memory tries to tell. No, 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 no. I, I was in back in 2000, uh, you know, a part of Virinci's life. Uh, I just want to go and remind him about uh, these things. And the security check says, no, 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 Virinci is right now in 2021. How can you come today and disturb him? And now this memory goes and brings, you know, uh, how we see it in the movies. You go bring a gang. I'll show you my strength. So now this will go and bring some more emotions and bring some more memories. And then it starts fighting with these security checks. But finally, like in every movie, these security checks win over these thoughts and only allow a few to living room. Now, sometimes these security checks might fail. It can be due to some chemical changes that happen inside the brain, or it can be due to stress affecting on these security checks. So there is a situation where you know the hero also loses. You know, these bad memories come and win over the hero and they come into your living room. So that is your conscious brain. So basically, the whole concept of overthinking is a failure in the security check of your thoughts where there are excessive thoughts coming from the past or rather excessive thoughts coming about the future. So that inability to stay in the present and where the thoughts coming from the past or thoughts coming from the future distract you or disturb you is the concept of overthinking. So undoubtedly, we are looking at a failure of a system inside the brain. And this failure could be a warning symptom to any of our uh, serious mental health issues. So I always tell people, if the complaint is overthinking, it is surely a warning sign that there is something happening inside the brain. And this needs to be evaluated by a mental health professional. And undoubtedly, we all know that early evaluation gives better prognostic results. Perfectly explained. Easy to connect with with all the checking points. And this also reminds me about uh, the Oscar nominated movie Inside Out. It has the same kind of depiction, perfectly explained. Thank you, sir. Um, coming down to the next question, the most common, another one which I personally have come across and I'm sure most of us might be having this is gastrointestinal issues. Even now among the audience also, there might be people who, I mean, who might be having uh, butterflies in the stomach or are having maybe constipation, diarrhea, or some issues with the digestive tract. And they will be on medication or they might have consulted a general physician or a, someone uh, and have been on medication maybe for three months, six months, and finally are being referred to mental health profession. And then begins the role. Would you like to throw some light on this very important issue? I think, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is the mind-body connect that we are discussing about. Uh, a lot of times, uh, we do see people presenting uh, with symptoms which look more physical than, uh, you know, uh, erupting from the brain. If we all go back uh, to the times when we were going to school, uh, Either one of us or you know, one of our friends did complain of severe stomach pain. And uh, this boy or girl was taken to the doctor and the physician ruled out any physical causes and said, no, no, uh, the stomach is all fine. 
and then the parents started seeing or the close uh, relatives started seeing that you can not a kar raha this is this is all fake he just doesn't want to go to school but we never thought that there could be some other cause which could have led to this stomach pain in that child it could be some underlying anxiety which could present the stomach pain it could be asymptomatic symptoms of depression or somatic symptoms of depression which could present as stomach pain and this is the whole concept that we are talking under the banner of the mind body connection so uh, let's uh, as uh, if if all of you can see me let's try to understand that my fist right now is the emotional center inside your brain which is called as amygdala so normally this amygdala is resting now if this is an activated amygdala this is a resting amygdala now what happens is this amygdala is in very close contact to a lot more centers so when this gets activated the rest all get activated you know probably just like uh, if you go back to some bollywood movies that you must have seen you know back in the 90s and 2000s they would have shown movies where you know uh, a hut get uh, catches fire and you know the whole village starts burning you know within a few minutes you know the fire keeps spreading from one to the other one to the other so the first hut activates the second one the second one activates the third one and similarly every time this amygdala gets activated it's not just the amygdala getting activated but it activates a lot more centers now what are these centers these centers are nothing but the connection to the heart a connection to the stomach a connection to your respiratory system a connection to your facial muscles or skin that is the reason when somebody has anxiety in the head the presentation could be in the heart where your heart is beating very fast the 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 the, the, the you know people come and say gabrahat ho raha the palpitations that you feel is actually coming from here the shortness of breath that you feel is actually coming from here the increased acidity increased pain in the stomach cramping in the stomach is coming from here some hot flushes on your skin is coming from here dryness in the mouth dryness in the throat is coming from here so basically a lot of times we see that people who have these physical symptoms first go to a physician and uh, probably when the physician fails to identify that this could be psychological the physician continues to treat the patient with some symptomatic medicines but the patient never achieves a relief and finally after four or six months the individual asks the doctor doctor is there something that we are missing is there something more that you can look into and then the physician says okay why don't you just make a mental health profession and then we we start taking a history we understand that most of these symptoms are directly related to the stress you know the person individual says you know uh, i have this stomach pain only before an interview only before a presentation i have these palpitations only when i talk to my boss i have this shortness of breath every time i need to file my returns so these kind of symptoms are very specifically suggestive of an underlying mental health issue a lot of times mental health issues can present with physical symptoms but we should always be cautious about identifying them and that is when we do not miss or delay treating these issues yes uh, you were just mentioning about uh, we going to the medical uh, professionals to get the you know the basic physical symptoms clarified if there is anything having said that how do doctors actually play a role when it comes to mental health issues there are questions like i have hypertension i have diabetes and there is maybe a psychological or a psychiatric issue there are such cases and also there are some advices which come from their doctors or family doctors would you want to say something about this i'll try to, I'll, i'll try to explain a lot of things uh, from this slide uh, So let's try to take an example here. So we have a, a, a 40 to 50 year old uh, young uh, male uh, who complains of chest pain. He has severe chest pain. He profusely starts sweating, or uh, his heart is beating very fast. He's not able to breathe, uh, and uh, he feels that uh, you know he's going to die at any moment. Uh, and suddenly his family members look at him. They get worried, and they call up uh, the 108 service, the ambulance service. the ambulance rushes into the 
uh, go to a community where this person stays. And then we put him into the ambulance and he's taken to the emergency department. And then the emergency physician uh, tries to auscultate his heart with a stethoscope. And then he gets an ECG done. Then they get a 2D echo done. And they do all the possible tests to rule out anything related to the heart or anything related to the lungs. And they give him all the normal reports and say, oh, you're absolutely fine, don't worry. He says, but it's pain. And he says, no, 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 I'll give you just a medicine that will relieve the pain. And they give him some medicine that relieves the pain. And this person goes back home. Seven days later, a similar episode happens again. And he is again brought into the ambulance, brought into the ICU, taken to the hospital, get all the investigations done. The doctor again says, no, no, don't worry. It's just you thinking. Like we were talking some time back. You're just overthinking. So stop doing that. Now this person goes back home and two questions in his head. How do I stop overthinking? And how do I stop these palpitations? Now the third time that he gets it, he's already lost hope. He knows what the doctor says. He's already very sure that the doctor says you're absolutely fine. And unfortunately, there have been times when people have told me that you know, the doctor starts shouting at them also. Why do you come so many times? You're wasting a bed. And now at this point, this person, you know, loses hope on the whole medical profession. And he starts suffering with it. So I think this is exactly where, uh, you know, a non-mental health professional doctor comes into play. Now let us understand the sad story in India as well as probably in many other countries. I as a doctor have done my five and a half years of MBBS and then done my three years of specialization in psychiatry. Now in my five and a half years of MBBS, my exposure to psychiatry is two weeks. So in five and a half years, an MBBS student reads only 14 days of psychiatry, which is a not so compulsive posting. You can even skip it, it's fine. Out of the 14 subjects that we study, the number of marks allotted to psychiatry is four marks. What I'm trying to tell here is a student finishing his MBBS, he has very, 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 very minimal knowledge about psychiatry. And now when this student takes up any other field, he could be a physician, he could be a surgeon, he could be the best cardiologist or the best gynecologist. But you need to understand their understanding about psychiatry is unfortunately very limited. And now when, you know, a person goes to their family physician and when the family physician brushes off mental health, the person would believe the family physician. doctor My doctor said nothing to worry. My doctor said stop overthinking. And this is where the whole gap between uh, other departments and mental health is coming. And the sufferer in this whole journey is the common man. So what I'm trying to tell here is uh, a lot of times people are, are uh, you know, uh, judged by the number of degrees they have, are judged by the number of gray hair they have, uh, more the gray hair, wiser than individual. But somewhere, mental health uh, knowledge has been lacking, not just with common people, but even with medical professional. And this is something very important, which I think the government and, you know, the private sectors or uh, you know, uh, NGOs and uh, you know, initiations like Vishwa should be talking about and creating the awareness so that this gap, this person who's been running to the emergency department for six months could have been treated for his underlying anxiety six months before. So we would have saved both the quality and quantity of his life. And that is exactly what we should be looking at. So if there is something your physician is not able to rule out, always remember that there could be something functional or there could be something psychological coming from the brain that could be causing these issues and a mental health professional can deal with it. Perfect explanation. So thanks a lot. I mean, I'm sure this might have cleared a lot of air where you have shown that demarcation of, you know, just having you know, maybe a paper or four marks or 10 marks in MBBS, but it's not completely about psychiatry. And that's entirely a different profession altogether. So a general physician would not be having so much of exposure, such as mental health profession. Thanks a lot for that information. Okay. Um, the, again, I should say the very, very common question and the fear of people is psychiatric medication. 
they are worried about, or uh, I mean, one among them is worried about the side effects or uh, maybe it can be addictive. So there are so many myths around it. And there's already a question uh, which is posed by Sukanya Baba, even in the group, asking about the reaction to psychiatric medication. So please debunk all the myths. Well, uh, when, we, when we talk about psychiatric treatments, uh, I always, uh, as a practitioner, believe in a holistic treatment. So what I say by a holistic treatment is, I would bring in all the dimensions possible that can help an individual get better. I always look into dietary changes. I look into lifestyle modification. I look into bringing in some behavioral changes. We bring in therapy. We bring in medical management. We bring in the role of spirituality, religiosity uh, in the person who believes in religion. The reason why I'm talking about this is the more the number of dimensions that we activate in an individual's life, the better the response is. Undoubtedly, pharmacotherapy has been well documented and proven for hundreds of years. Now, the difficulties in convincing somebody for a psychiatric treatment starts off with not having laboratory diagnostic tests. So now uh, you go to a doctor, you know, he says, okay, get your vitamin D3 done. Uh, you get the report and say, okay, my D3 is less. The report says, okay, this is your value and this is the normal weight. We all know that. And now we know, okay, there is a deficiency. So let me take some. So it's easy to tell somebody, okay, you take vitamin D3 or there is fever, you take paracetamol. There is an infection. There is some increased uh, WBC count in your blood reports or the blood report is showing malaria, typhoid. You take an antibiotic. Now, when it comes to psychiatry, somebody comes to me, they start talking to me, I do the examination, and then I say, okay, I think, uh, you know, the, my probable diagnosis is a depressive episode. So, uh, I, would, I would suggest medical management. So, firstly, the first question is, how did you say you are, I'm having depression? It's all me who spoke. You didn't even ask me a single question. How can you say? So, now we need to understand that. Uh, there is a particular examination called as the mental status examination, what we do. Second, there are assessments, what the psychiatrist or the clinical psychologist does, through which we have scores, because we all believe in numbers. I mean, let's, let's be frank. I like to see things in numbers. Uh, so, you know, when, when my value shows, okay, I have a se severe depression, my score is 40, then it's convincing and now, finally, after the diagnosis, when it comes to medical management, individuals ask me, is there anything else that we can do other than medicine? So firstly, a medication is prescribed according to international guidelines. So with every disorder, we uh, you know, rate the severity of the disorder into mild or moderate or severe. So what the guidelines say is, if it is a milder depressive episode, start with therapy, start with lifestyle modification. Start with, uh, you know, dietary changes. If it is a moderate uh, depressive episode, they say start medical management and therapy at once so that the results are better. But when somebody lands up in a severe depressive episode or a very severe depressive episode, the ability to grasp what the therapist is telling you and the ability to, you know, keep it into action is very difficult. That is when the whole concept of medicines work. Now, like Gita Ji was talking about, you know, the whole concept of side effects, undoubtedly every allopathic medicine has a side effect. Then why do we still prescribe it? Because we are looking at the risk-benefit ratio. Anywhere where the benefit is much higher than the risk, we try to come forward. Now, second most important thing is the concept of addiction. Now, what happens is there are different classes of medicines in psychiatry. Depressants, antipsychotics, mood stabilizers, benzodiazepines, and undoubtedly a class called benzodiazepines has an addiction potential. Every time a psychiatrist prescribes a benzodiazepine, the psychiatrist is more cautious than the patient. You know, I tell them to come back at a particular frame of time where I know that you know the person would have not developed uh, addiction or those changes have not yet developed in the brain. When we try to remove that medicine, taper it off. 
But now people feel that every psychiatric medicine has an addiction. Two reasons for that. One, some people might need medicines for a longer time. Now let's try to take diabetes. Let's try to take uh, high blood pressure, hypertension. We never tell an individual, why are you taking medicines for so long? You'll get addicted to it. We never say that. In diabetes, we believe that it is a necessity. In hypertension, we believe it is a necessity. But when it comes to psychiatry, we start feeling that, oh, you got used to the medicine. And that's not true. One, we need to understand that even in psychiatry, there could be a necessity where an individual needs medicines for a longer time. Now, how do we differentiate it between addiction? Let's try to take a common criteria for addiction. According to ICD-10, that is International Classification of Disorders, you need to have three out of six to say that someone is addicted. One is tolerance. Tolerance is, now let's try to take the example of alcohol. You know, somebody who drinks. The first time he had a drink, uh, probably 30 ml or 60 ml has given him that euphoria, that kick. Six months later, 60 ml is not enough. He needs at least 300 ml to get that euphoric feeling. And that is tolerance where your body is not happy with that quantity, it wants more, it wants more. Does that happen with medication? I have never seen coming to me and telling me, Sir, thoda dose bada do. Everybody comes and tells me, dose kam karo, but nobody is told you. <laughs> so, tolerance, we can keep it aside. Withdrawal symptoms. Now, with medication, especially antidepressant medicines, there is something called as discontinuation syndrome. When you suddenly stop taking the medicines, there are symptoms. Now, I explain this in a very simple way. Now, today I start climbing the ladder. I've climbed, I've climbed, I've climbed, I've climbed. I finally reached the 90th step. Now, I want to come down. How do we come down? Can I jump from the top? No, I'm going to break my head. So, I need to again come down one step at once. That's exactly what we do with medication also. When somebody has been on X amount of medicine for a while, you can't suddenly stop it. That's like jumping from the top. You need to gradually taper it step by step, step by step, step by step and come down. And this will solve the problem of these discontinuation syndrome. Now, the third criteria is strong desire to use the substance, which is again not there with medicines. Difficulty controlling the use where I tell take one and the person without my knowledge only is taking two. Neglecting other interests. What happens with alcohol, you know, an alcoholic is, or somebody with alcoholism is not really interested in anything else, not interested in activities, not interested in meeting people, not interested in working. And, you know, there is a persistent substance use despite harmful effects. When you know it is damaging you, you still want to use it. So if you look at this criteria, a person taking medication does not fit into this criteria. But still, like I said, there could be discontinuation syndrome, so always taper it gradually. And some individuals might need it for a longer time. I'm sure it must have happened with a lot of us, where the doctor prescribed as an antibiotic and the throat infection did not reduce. Then the doctor said, no, use it for three more days. We never asked, sir, why is he using for three days? Why am I supposed to use it for six days? Am I addicted to it? No. So this is a necessity. And let's try to understand that every allopathic medicine prescribed by a registered medical practitioner is only for the betterment of the individual. Perfect, sir. Sir, um, a relevant question posted here in the group. Uh, Malati Raj says that psychiatric treatment is very expensive and even counseling is. And how do you think a common man can afford that? What would you like to I, I agree to this to an extent. <laughs> I, I agree to this. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, we need to understand uh, that there are other facilities, especially let's take Roshni. I think uh, Roshni is a charitable. Thank you. Like an NGO. So, you know, there are there are places. I think where uh, uh, Gita has studied Svita uh, you know, I, I would refer a lot of patients, my patients to Svita Ruktar, not just about the cost, but even the quality. Quality used to be maintained and, you know, it's, it's uh, cost friendly also. So somewhere uh, we need to understand that psychiatric treatment or psychological counseling looks costlier because it is a long-term treatment. It's not about that particular session that is costly because 
a psychiatrist or a psychologist who spends minimum 30 minutes to one hour with a patient charges the same as what a pulmonologist or a cancer specialist charges today. But looking at the duration, because you need probably more number of visits, because you need probably, uh, you know, uh, repeated visits, uh, you know, in frequent times, that is what makes it look costlier. But undoubtedly, there are, uh, you know, uh, places where we get the same quality treatment. And uh, I think this is what the message we should be giving it to the government. Uh, because uh, the other day when I was talking to uh, Mr. Mani, I was telling him, you know, back in 2020, I remember WHO saying that the next pandemic could be a mental health pandemic. So the way we are preparing all the beds in Gandhi Hospital and the new uh, outlet, uh, are we able to do the same preparation for mental health too? And once we start doing that, I think it can reach every individual despite uh, the ability to pay. Dr. Virinchi and Geeta ma'am, uh, if I may also add uh, just one point, uh, and this is for our speakers. Uh, last year in 2020, uh, the IRDAI, which is the government uh, entity that uh, uh, basically regulates insurance policies, has mandated that every insurance company should have uh, packages that cover mental health. So if that is something that is deterring you from seeking the help that you need, uh, please reach out to your insurance company and make sure that you are on a package that uh, covers mental health. And then it will, I don't think it should be that big a problem. Thanks a lot, Mani, but still that's not in force. <laughs> it's only a rule which has come up. I think the, uh, the, the central uh, insurance uh, policy has not yet been accepted by the Telangana state. I think there's some issue, but we are working on yes. it. I mean, uh, though I'm not really actively a part of it, I am also a part of the Telangana Psychiatric Society group. And I keep following the updates and uh, they're doing a phenomenal job on working towards this. Uh, I know that, you know, uh, you know, be that superintendent uh, or, you know, the rest of the faculty, uh, everyone's working towards it. And, you know, I think uh, let's all hope that it comes into action very, very, very soon. Thank you, sir. Yes. Uh, just to add on one point here, most of the time we get very severe uh, psychiatric uh, cases where they come down for counseling and we have to refer them for medication. Because we tell them directly that you are not in a state to get the counseling. Medication is required. You need to take a break for three days, take the medication, and maybe then you would be prepared. So even there, medication is mandatory. I mean, just to add on. So counseling can begin only when we are in a state to understand what the speaker is talking, when we are able to actually understand the terms and able to acknowledge and revert back. That is again about medication. And I remember, uh, you know, a uh, very uh, important thing or a very nice thing that you would always tell me, you know, a couple of years back uh, uh, when we used to meet regularly. Uh, therapy or a, a change with therapy is not seen in the session. It is seen in between two sessions. So today you meet your therapist, your therapist gives you a lot of advices. And if you're able to do that for the next seven days before you come to the next session, that is where the change starts. So to have that ability to work for those seven days, sometimes medicines give you that kickstart. So that one nitro boost that uh, you know can give uh, to the brain is medicine. And there have been innumerable reports about medicines, uh, the role of medicines increasing the longevity of an individual's life. So uh, there have been studies which talk about neurogenesis. You know, uh, in some uh, illnesses, you know, the neurons are getting depleted, the brain cells. And, you know, these medicines have the ability to bring back those neurons or, uh, you know, give space for new neurons to come up. So these are like huge uh, things that can happen with that one pill. And uh, the best thing, at least in 2021, while we are having the session, I can say that in today's world, we have a basket of medicines available that can cater each individual's needs. Somebody comes to me and tells me, okay, give me a medicine, but I don't want it to be sedated. I don't want sleep. We have it. Somebody says, okay, I want a medicine, but I don't want to put on weight. We have it. Somebody says, I want to put on weight. I've lost a lot of weight. We have it. So we have a variety of medicines today that can actually uh, cater uh, every individual's needs. 
at times people who are admitted in rehab centers may be for addiction or other severe psychiatric illness uh, as far as they are in the rehab maybe they are doing well but the moment they are out of the rehabilitation uh, center they say that the patient do not show that improvement or are back to the old lifestyle and the rehabilitation center expenses were really high so what do you want to say about this actually is this true well uh, you know what what really happens is uh, when you compare a developed country to india uh, now suppose if i am uh, working in a grocery store and uh, my boss uh, understood that i have an alcohol issue and uh, he is uh, you know uh, i've i've done some wrong behavior and he is uh, unhappy with me and uh, there was a police issue so finally the police sends me to the rehabilitation center and now once i'm in the rehab i need to finish the due course of my treatment and then only come back with the certificate that i have finished my rehabilitation and that is when i get my job this is what happens in a developed country but right here in india that does not happen i mean we are not really worried about or uh, you know if the doctor has given a certificate saying that yes that fixed duration of rehabilitation is done so now because of this a lot of times what we realize like i i myself uh, uh, run a rehabilitation center and what i see is because of emotional reasons the patient is brought out of the rehab much before the speculated time so when we know that you know a particular substance might take so many months you know probably the initial recovery that they see and they were like nahi nahi uh, i want to take him home manchiga uh, ipenadu so tiskel potamo so these are the kind of words that we listen and now the next thing what we need to understand is what happens in the rehab is uh, something happening in a protected environment while the person is being exposed to the outside world i think the whole team you know starting from uh, you know the psychiatrist to the clinical psychologist to the counselors to the social workers to the occupational therapist there is a huge role on all of us in preparing the patient to the stressors that we are going to be exposed to now because when when you are sitting in that bubble it's it's easy because you know you are not getting any substance there but still that's important because that's the preparation phase and now the whole process of preparing him firstly detoxifying the patient then the whole concept of de addiction in the whole concept of de addiction preparing for the outside world for a functional life is what happens one these services do not happen two the patient is not there in the rehab for that particular time for all the services to happen and otherwise also unfortunately in regards to substance use the statistical data is always you know on the negative side and if we can see the american statistics also very clearly the dropout rates are around 70 to 80 percent also and you can see that the relapse rates are also 40 to 60 percent which is as similar as the indian statistics but why still rehabilitation because the the little period also where the patient or the person suffering with substance use is inside the rehabilitation center he is sober and while being sober a lot of things happen you know one the sleep gets better you know or he is able to put his words into action we are able to focus on the long term health we are able to repair the acute injuries that happened to the liver or that happened to the lung and you know we have that one person chance at least to make him more passionate about his life and that surely is why we have have a feeling but still rehabilitation or uh, is a success formula for dealing with addictions thank you sir uh, i would like to add uh, one other thing here i don't know uh, if uh, people are aware the eragada mental hospital the government hospital we have the rehabilitation center there and even the criminal uh, department over there where the prisoners are kept and we have been i mean i have done the internship as well over there and get tremendous results just by be being there in the rehabilitation center so uh, i mean that adds on to whatever you have been uh, telling that thank you sir all right so the next question is um, again 
the very important uh, question. 2019, just before the pandemic, 1,39,123, a very big number. Suicides were reported in 2019 by uh, National Crime Records Bureau. And the latest one, uh, 2021 statistics, according to Forbes India, they are 17 every one like uh, people who commit suicide. I mean, that's a very big number. We are standing second in the world when it's coming to suicide. I mean, that's very disheartening. And how do you think depression or anxiety or any other psychiatric or psychological illness can lead to losing a person? And when do you think actually the caretakers or family members can you know, get that red signal? And when do you think they need intervention or help? Well, uh, uh, back in 2019, when uh, I had the opportunity to be the guest speaker. Uh, Sir, again, louder, please. Uh, in 2019, uh, I was uh, uh, fortunate to be a guest speaker in the annual national conference of the Indian Psychiatric Society. And I spoke about, uh, uh, you know, uh, suicides uh, and the recent uh, Crime Report Bureau uh, statistics. And frankly talking, these numbers... Are, uh, are not the real numbers because there is a lot of underreporting that happens in India. There are a lot of passive suicides that happen in India which are not uh, kept in these records or uh, because these reports uh, speak about very few number of suicides happening in a state like Uttar Pradesh, which is the largest state. But unfortunately, we need to understand that uh, few facts about suicides. Suicides in women are much, much higher than in men. And uh, out of the number of suicides that we've spoken about, age group between 15 to 45. And this is the most productive age group in an individual's life. So this is something we need to be worried about. So these suicides that are happening could be because of multiple reasons, but one big reason for not being able to stop these numbers is lack of awareness. A lot of times an individual having a depressive episode, an individual having a severe anxiety episode, or even uh, a severe, uh, uh, you know, schizophrenia or bipolarity or OCD is not being able to understand that what is happening with him is a mental health issue. Two, people in and around him are not giving him the right kind of support. Like we've spoken sometime back, people brush off mental health issues. Every time an individual wants to come and talk about his sadness, there is some great person who comes and says, even I was sad and I got over it. So you yeah, also... I... So, you know, a lot of brushing off, a lot of uh, underdiagnosis in regards to depressions and anxieties has been one of the greatest reasons. We need to understand that it's very few times where the suicides are impulsive, but a lot of times they are planned. So when I talk about planned suicides, I'm talking about gradually an individual going up to that thought. And this is a process and there are many steps in this process that can be stopped. And this can happen only with regular screening. Now let's try to understand sometime back the reason why I spoke about diabetes and screening mental health is here. Now suppose if I know I'm at a risk of diabetes and if I'm getting my blood sugars done every six months, I know that tricking point where you know my blood sugar was above normal and this is where I start acting upon it I tell, you know, uh, it's better than waiting till my blood sugar shoots up to 400 and I landed up in the ICU. This is exactly what we should be working on mental health also, and especially in regards to suicides. One, we need regular screening. Two, we need regular awareness programs. And three, we need to bring that stigma out. And I think this is exactly why we're doing this session today. So we need to explain an individual that this particular thought in you is not a sign of weakness. And a lot of times when youngsters come to me with suicidal thoughts, they start crying to me, not because of their illness, but because they have a diagnosis to it. Because they're worried about being labeled. Because they're worried about being called weak. And I tell them only one thing. I tell them, if you are sitting in your house and watching a cricket match, you'll never get injured. If you go onto the ground and you start playing, there is a risk of injury. So similarly, to me, a working brain has a risk of injury. 
So if somebody comes and tells me I don't have a mental health issue, my simple question in my head is, are you using your brain? Because everybody is having a mental health issue. That's because our brains are working. And that is not a sign of weakness. It is as simple as how an athlete can have a muscle injury, you know, how a cricketer can or a tennis player can have a tennis elbow. Similarly, all of us who are excessively working with our brains have a risk of developing some repairs. And I tell everybody, you know, don't treat this as a hospital. This is a garage center. You come here for repair and I'm the mechanic. So let's keep it as simple as that with mental health. And these numbers are surely going to drop if we could be, if we can achieve that. Okay. Um, will not take much time, but I just have three, four questions more, which are even a part of the uh, group chat. So sometimes there are cases where uh, partners are seeking legal separation due to mental health conditions. In which instances and when do you think this can happen and what can we do? They come down mostly for letters, you know, or assessment results, which can be produced uh, in the court to seek separation. What do you have to say about this? I'll, I'll try to keep it a little short, ma'am. Uh, uh, but uh, one thing I would like to tell everyone here is mental health condition is not grounds for divorce. So uh, the, uh, it's, it's very few uh, situations where the court realizes that you know the spouse is unable to take the role of the spouse and uh, there is a risk of harm uh, to uh, the partner or the children. But otherwise, there is no situation where mental health conditions uh, are grounds for divorce. It is as similar as a physical health condition. Uh, just because somebody uh, develops a diabetes or somebody develops cancer, they do not, uh, they, they are not allowed to take divorce. So similarly, uh, mental health conditions cannot be grounds for divorce. So this is something I would like to say. Thank you, sir. Okay. And uh, I think uh, we have covered this when we have to seek therapy and counseling or a psychiatric consultation together because both have to go hand in hand at times or at times it's only medication counseling doesn't work. Right. And maybe in cases of couple therapy or something, maybe just one partner may require medication and the other person may not require, right? So other instances. And now coming to children, Sometimes young parents especially fail to identify symptoms that actually need uh, support from a mental health professional. So can you suggest some of them or some of the most important symptoms which the parents can identify that they have to come down to someone to seek help? Well, I think firstly, I would like to let everybody know that, uh, you know, a child as young as one year old can also have a mental health issue. So a lot of times, you know, we uh, brushed off saying that, you know, okay, he's a child, he's fine. I think the whole COVID times also have been seen, uh, you know, uh, initially, uh, you know, people thought it was, you know, population between 20 to 55 age group were the most affected. And then they started feeling that uh, maybe elderly people are also getting affected, because, but they are not able to express. But now the whole focus is on children and how difficult it has been for children throughout these hard times. And uh, it is not an overemphasis when I said a one-year-old child also can be having mental health issues. Uh, so we do see, uh, and I still remember uh, my pediatrics professor telling me that uh, his experience was seeing mental health issues as young as a six-month-old baby. So uh, what we need to realize is in that toddler age group, because the child cannot speak about the issue, we need to be focusing on some red flag signals of not sleeping on time, because usually at that age, the baby sleeps for 14 hours, 16 hours. And if there is a disturbance in those sleeping pack, uh, pattern, that is when we should be looking. Second, the feeding pattern. You know, uh, 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 a young toddler you know, feeds every hour, every second hour. But if the child is refusing feeds, if the child is not active, uh, the few hours that the child is awake, and if the child is not sleeping for those number of hours, yes, it is surely a health-related issue. And after the physical health uh, aspects being ruled out, we need to look at psychological aspects. And some causes can be being away from the parent, not getting that skin-to-skin uh, -skin touch from the parent, uh, and sometimes, you know, being ignored or, uh, you know, uh, there have been physical abuses that happen with young children also. 
or toddlers also. So these aspects need to be kept in mind. Now, when we talk about the next age group between you know four and twelve years, uh, it's again difficult because you know even till the age group of twelve, the child might not realize that this particular change happening in them could be a mental health issue or even a health issue. But we need to be uh, looking at aspects like you know the child not enjoying the activities what the child usually enjoys. The child may not be wanting to go to school. That's what every child has. But if the child is not wanting to go to his best friend's birthday party also, then we should be questioning. Or if the child is not wanting to go out and play, then we should be questioning. And at the same time, looking at biological functions like sleep and appetite is something that we need to look at all the age groups. If the child is trying to be isolated, not mingling with people. And a lot of times we understand the suffering of the child through their play with the toys. So uh, the way they play with the toys, the kind of portrayal they do with the toys uh, also helps us understand. And uh, surely between the age groups of 13 to 18, uh, the child needs to be frequently spoken to. So what has been happening is because the parents feel, especially during COVID times, and the parents feel, okay, the child is at home, I'm also at home. The parents feel that the child is taken care of. But in today's generation, especially when each of us sit in different rooms with our own gadgets, uh, I think the child frequently needs to be sit, uh, spoken to, spend that time, and to everybody, not just children, adults, uh, every age group, I would like to say that social health is not social media. So we need to come out of social media and we have a particular aspect in the brain which works on social health. And as long as we are not socializing, that aspect of the brain is not growing. That is a bad sign. So it is like going to the gym and just working on the arms and not working on the rest of the body. So that body would be a very abnormal body. So that's how the brain also needs to be work, uh, worked upon all the dimensions. Physical, mental, social, spiritual are the four dimensions which needs to be activated on a day-to-day -day basis. Perfect, sir. Perfect. Absolutely fine. Just to add on, I mean, even when they come down for some assessments or any kind of counseling, we dig back history right from birth cry. So the symptoms start from there. Even we are speaking about the newborn, we ask about the developmental stone, I mean, milestones and all. So they all add up to any kind of symptoms. All right, thank you for that. And the next question is uh, the current situation. Post COVID, I'm sure uh, any clinical psychologists or doctors here might have come up with such kind of cases where there is someone who is complaining about some uh, somatoform disorders, I mean, um, okay, uh, like they might be uh, complaining about poor sleep, appetite, um, uh, for ladies, irregular menstrual cycle, hair fall, or there are even situations where they are telling that, I feel my heart is racing, I think I'm going to die. I think my lungs are not functioning properly. Maybe they had been tested positive six months ago and six months later they feel that you know they are still under that covid effect and are still taking medication for covid so what do you want to say about this i mean this is forming the major bulk of at least my cases i'll, I'll tell you my experience in the last two years man. Uh, i think when the first wave started uh, i was seeing more patients with uh, uh, complaints of excessive fear or that was, you know, people presenting with anxieties, panics, and especially OCDs. If you all remember, uh, the grocery stores were running out of sanitizers where we were excessively buying them and, you know, keeping at home. Uh, the first, uh, you know, wave, uh, this was majorly what I saw, including uh, people who, uh, you know, had COVID, you know, because they're suddenly isolated. There's greatest fear about, you know, dying. Uh, and, you know, there's fear about, you know, who's going to take care of my family? You know, how is the family going to run? I have a small child. So these were the major, uh, uh, you know, uh, situations that we saw during the first wave. Now, when it came to second wave, uh, you know, though there are people continuing to come with the fear of contracting the virus, and there are people coming with, uh, you know, the fear of dying because they have the active infection of COVID, the third category was surprising to me initially. And uh, this category was, uh, majorly, uh, you know, people who had a prior COVID infection, they came out of the COVID, but still continue to have some symptoms. I understand anxiety about getting COVID. I understand anxiety while having COVID. 
but i was surprised why do you have an anxiety now when you have antibodies with you and that is when you know uh, i was trying to look into research and uh, so because you know covid is very new to everyone uh, but you know there are uh, some uh, very good reports international reports which have spoken about a post covid sequel or post covid complications being neurological and psychiatric complications so in simple words what i'm trying to say is the virus is not just affecting the lungs it's even affecting the brain and somebody who had the virus could have the risk of might have the risk of developing a psychological condition which they never had and most common things what we are seeing are sleep disturbances depressions anxieties uh and uh, you know uh, uh, obsessive behaviors which continue even after the virus so these are a few things that we are seeing yes post covid sequel is something that we see i'm sure a lot of people must have seen people complaining of hair fall like you said uh, even even my guy friends have been telling me that you know they've been excessively losing hair uh, you know after the virus uh, so these are some post covid complications and they surely do need uh, medical attention just like how you visit a dermatologist i think seeking help from a mental health professional for post covid complications is also important thank you sir i hope shrikant your question is answered this was a similar question from the uh, group as well okay and um, another last question um, this is also the question of uh, mr ramakrishna vemuri from the audience um, of course we are a country where we believe in alternate therapies like yoga energy healing naturopathy ayush to speak on a broader term so what do you want to say about these kind of alternate treatments well i think uh, you know uh, the comprehensive textbook of psychiatry ctp that uh, we read as postgraduate students has a separate chapter about alternative medicine so uh, sometime back like we were talking about a holistic treatment i think uh, treatment in mental health has been changing and now we need those interventions to because they have been proven on a a bigger scientific platform so you know one uh, you know sometime back also i was talking about spirituality uh, so as soon as we spoke about spirituality you know you you very much sound like you know an old school guy uh, you know talking about god and talking about uh, uh, you know uh, those rituals but uh, in today's world uh, the royal college of london the royal college of psychiatry has a spirituality wing which has 3000 mental health professionals working on it and there have been wonderful results that they have found wonderful changes that they have found in the brain so they are not just studying the patients or the person's individual perception but they are even checking about the changes happening in the brain so these are like those functional mri studies at very high level what they do to see which brain structure is actually being worked upon and they saw great results in people's higher centers you know like the hippocampus like the amygdala and all these centers uh, are showing some positive results in aspects like spirituality as well as in yoga uh, 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 there, there was a slide that i wanted to put up you know which speaks about a meta analysis about how yoga brings about positive changes inside the brain and these are not published by indians or uh, Uh, you know indian journals but these are published by international journals so i would say a big go go uh, there are a lot of times you know i i tell people you know uh, the role of aroma therapy in depression the role of massage therapy in depression so you know these are all concepts which were never previously uh, spoken about but undoubtedly all of them have been showing great results so i would say a person with depression has a variety of options these days i think we should see it in a positive way that we also you know it's not just about taking medicines it's not just just about therapy but there are uh, aspects but again one last thing i would like to say before i end these things should be suggested by a mental health professional now what happens is going for a run every day is a very good habit but what would happen when you run with a broken leg you're worsening the injury so similarly somebody having a mental health issue is not always a good candidate for yoga so let your mental health professional decide what is the severity of your illness 
and what is the aspect or what which is the dimension that you should be activating because a lot of people come to me and say that i've already tried all of this i was like why you you don't need to i mean you shouldn't be maybe sometimes you're worsening the issue by doing it your brain is already worked up and you're putting excessive strain on it so let any of these therapies come through a mental health professional and uh, that's the best way thank you sir uh, just for everyone's information Varinji sir is a big fan of all the alternate therapies. You know, there were cases where he would uh, say to patients, Nikoka banam kawala, rendu banalu kawala, to cure yourself. I mean, that was his standard dialogue where he would suggest, along with medication, to go for therapy or yoga or meditation, but the cases depend. Right, sir? So I'll quickly take a few questions from the audience. Uh, this is one question which is come up telling it's a personal question where she's telling my older son is not taking up any job and is full of anger and blame he seems to be on the threshold of PT, uh, ptsd how can i help him he's not open to therapy so i need some help if possible please so one undoubtedly if we are uh, if uh, we know that there have been some past traumas uh, and you know uh, if you are looking at ptsd as a diagnosis undoubtedly therapy is the first option we need to sit down, we need to get that comfort zone and we need to help him vent his emotions out. I always say venting out is such a magical experience. There have been times when, uh, you know, there is someone who's taken my appointment, uh, paid the fees, waited for a very long time in the waiting hall, came into the cabin, uh, spoke for 30 minutes and even before I had uttered a word, they said that, okay, doctor, I'm feeling fine. I think I'll leave. I was like, I still haven't said anything. I think you came for my consultation. But that's not always needed because venting out is such a beautiful weapon. Uh, it, it's just like probably how uh, I used to feel when I used to carry those heavy bags to school, come back home and get that bag off and throw it at one corner. The relief that I would get is something what I believe venting out is uh, helpful in. And when you went out to the right person, when you went out to a professional person, I think the results are great. Second thing, when we are talking about anger, we need to understand that anger could be, uh, uh, you know, sometimes a symptom of depression also. There are atypical symptoms of depression where anger and irritability can be. Uh, even, you know, an eminent person like Sigmund Freud says, anger is nothing but a suppressed sadness. So we need to be looking at that aspect also. Third aspect about looking into anger, I would say, the kind of lifestyle an individual is having. Today, the kind of games that an individual plays uh, online and the kind of movies that we all watch, they have a very big impact on our brains. You know, when you're watching a lot of crime and you're playing games, which has a lot of shooting and firing, an individual tends to develop that personality trait. So we need to be looking at those aspects also. Last thing, not working, amotivational uh, issues have become, uh, you know, a lot more after the advent of electronic media. Because uh, if suppose the room that I am in right now, if I'm left in this room without anything in this room, I would still find an alternative to entertain myself. That's how a human brain works. Suppose if there is a history book which I hate the most, I would still open that book and I would start reading it and I would start loving it. But today's world, that entertainment, what we previously used to search for, is coming through this one gadget. So now we don't need to work for it anymore. Why would anybody want to go explore anything? And that is something also what we need to look at because we are giving electronic gadgets to our children as uh, status symbols or as luxuries or as necessities also. But the usage of it is uh, somewhere uh, uh, being the major cause for all of these issues. Perfect, sir. Yes, sir. The next question is Mr. from uh, Mr. Mani. He is asking you to speak about privacy and confidentiality when it's coming to mental health? Well, I think uh, this is a very important aspect. Uh, thank you so much for asking this, Mr. Mani. Uh, uh, a lot of times, you know, uh, you know, uh, an individual comes uh, and tells me that, you know, I, I, I wanted to come to you six months before, but you know my friend. So that's the reason I did not come. Or probably you're treating my spouse. So that's the reason I did not come. Uh, so what uh, I would like to tell in simpler words is, if today uh, an 18-year-old boy comes to me and tomorrow he goes back home and tells his parents that I visited a psychiatrist, 
and uh, all of a sudden these are real situations all of a sudden the parents uh, rush into the hospital and say i heard my son came to you what happened i tell them only one simple thing i can disclose anything after taking your son's permission so even if it is your own blood we do not disclose anything that we have spoken until you give us that right and permission to do that so this is something that we are trained to be and this is something that we are uh, trained for decades before we get this degree into our hand so uh, i would like to assure everyone seeking mental health help uh, that uh, this is ups- there is absolute confidentiality and uh, the most important thing is i want you all to trust your mental health professional because in times today where mental health professionals or any health professional are also being uh, you know uh, bad with their morals and times today when people seeking help are also not being nice to you know their uh, uh, you know doctors uh, i think there should be a gap uh, the gap that is there should be bridged at this point we need to trust you know our therapist as much as we trust ourselves and sometimes during mental health issues probably you do not have trust on yourself but have the trust on your mental health professional and things are going to be great we are always here to help yes we all work for money that's that's all we all need at the end of the day but the passion that drives us towards this subject is very different uh, that's the reason we have very few mental health professionals uh, because a lot of people do not come into this profession a lot of people cannot stay in this profession uh, and uh, let's save at least the people who are there that's all i would say thank you sir thanks a lot okay we will just take one last question i think so we are much beyond there is a volunteer from seva counseling mr rajendra tapadia he says uh, we recommend a lot of callers to psychiatrists one common con- uh, concern that callers have is that doctor doesn't spend much time maybe 2 to 3 minutes in repeat visits and would typically ask them to repeat the medication for 2 to 3 months the patient feels that he is not heard of his concerns relevant questions please do what uh, uh, very very uh, true uh, sir rajan uh, i've i've heard this from a lot of people too and probably uh, uh, geeta ji knows that you know my style of working was very different uh, is is very different because of this concern uh, i've heard this kind of a complaint so uh, my minimum period for consultation is 30 minutes and if it is going beyond that i tell them that you know uh, i would give you a different time or you know probably in regards to the charges uh, why i am specifically talking about this is uh, you know i'll i'll give you some funny incidents about how 2 uh, 3 minutes of uh, treatment or diagnosis goes so now as soon as i come i sit in front of a psychiatrist i'm already very panicky and you know i'm anxious i don't know what to say so uh, probably i tell my name and what i do and by then already that one or two minutes is done and then uh, i say uh, doctor i have a sleep issue and the doctor says okay and now that sleep issue could be a part of my depression that sleep issue could be part of my anxiety or i could be having the uh, you know uh, just an insomnia so i i surely do believe that you know a detailed history is what is important exactly. uh, a lot of uh, psychiatrists who do not there are counselors and you know we do have some interns who come sometimes who are a great help you know i tell them you know when they ask me sir do you charge for internship i was like do you charge for working i was like no, then i also don't charge because you know it's it's a give and take thing you know you are learning you are helping us you are helping a lot of people because sometimes what happens is when we give more time the issue is there is somebody waiting outside uh, an elderly patient who cannot sit somebody who recently underwent a surgery not able to sit for a long time so there are a lot of issues that happen with the professionals also but time is the most important thing that defines the quality of mental health service that you give this is something that i would say thanks a lot sir so with this i think so we will uh, end thank you uh, the question thank you so much geeta ma'am uh, thank you so much dr virin ji uh, it has been truly enlightening and uh, a lot of uh, the stigma uh, we hope has been uh, overcome uh, there is no shame in seeking help please if you need help please reach out